And good morning once again to everyone, and welcome to the Metro Manila Health Research and Development Consortium Fourth International Symposium and Eleventh Scientific Conference. So, to start off, allow me to introduce the members of the MMHRDC. The presenting organizations are as follows. We have the MMHRDC, we have the Far Eastern University, we have Our Lady of Fatima University, we have the Peace to HRD, uh, and um, BOSD, uh, we have the Commission on Higher Education and the University of the Philippines. So just to show you the objectives for this morning's um, symposium, allow me to read to everyone the general objective of the webinar. Um, it is uh, it's a collaborative partnership in all health researches. Specifically, it will showcase research works on aging science. It will provide a venue for international exchange of ideas and research findings on how, as a society, we can become a society of super seniors. We will provide an opportunity for allied health professionals, researchers, students, seniors in their careers, 
to learn from world-class researchers and practitioners on how to prepare themselves and their loved ones to become super seniors. And lastly, to capacitate allied health in institutions, practitioners, students, seniors, and their careers on the rights and benefits that are legally mandated and required for all Filipino senior citizens. We will be having post tests and evaluation mechanics at the end of the program. So flash to the screen are some of the things that the participants and the delegates will need to know with regard to the post tests and evaluation mechanics. Please be reminded the certificates will be sent via email. So kindly ensure that you enter the correct email address when you register. We will also have a question and answer uh, portion at the end of each lecture. And you can use the Zoom chat box and the Facebook page will also be uh, utilized for the questions that our participants and delegates may be posing. So participation participants who are planning to send their questions are requested to kindly indicate your name and affiliation when dropping questions via the Zoom chat box or the comment section of the Facebook live streaming. So again, we are once again live via Facebook. 10 minutes will be um, allocated for each speaker to answer questions from the audience. And the number of questions that will be accommodated will depend on the availability of time that we will be having for this morning session. So to deliver the opening remarks, let us all welcome the chair of the MMHRDC steering committee and the executive director of the National Institute of Health from the University of the Philippines, Manila. Please welcome Dr. Eva Maria Cutionco de la Paz. DOST Philippine Council for Health Research and Development Executive Director, Dr. Jaime Montoya. Commission on Higher Education, Commissioner Dr. Lilian de las Liagas, our distinguished keynote speaker, UP Manila Chancellor and MMHRDC Lead Convener, Dr. Carmencita Padilla, DOSD NCR Director and Lead Convener, Engineer Jose Patalimud III, DOH MMHRDC Director, Dr. Corazon Flores, esteemed speakers, colleagues from various government agencies, representatives from the current member institutions of MMHRDC, and the Regional Health Research and Development Consortia, friends, and to all health enthusiasts, a pleasant morning to all and welcome to the Metro Manila Health Research and Development Consortium webinar series entitled, The Road to Super Seniors, The Science of Aging. It's earlier than you think, but it's never too late. This webinar series comes at a time when the world is still grappling with the adverse and devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on politics, culture, economics, and most especially on our day-to-day -day interaction with our colleagues, friends, and family. This pandemic has dramatically altered the dynamics of our normal lifestyle in ways we've never imagined before. As the rest of the world is racing to find a cure and solutions to the COVID-19 pandemic, our country's health system is likewise trying and steadily adapting to the new normal. Thanks primarily to the country's selfless health professionals who continue to persevere in alleviating the suffering of the Filipino people across all sectors of society. But we need to strategize and find innovative ways that would build the capacity of our people in adapting and living through this new normal. In doing so, we should not forget one of our most vulnerable sectors, the elderly Filipinos. Just like us, they are also experiencing the numbing anxiety and uncertainty caused by this pandemic and even boredom. Guidelines and policies have to be crafted that can help them cope with the pandemic and empower them to be valued members of society, remaining productive for their families and communities and doing what they want to do are the hallmarks of healthy aging. Maintaining one's health while undergoing the aging process requires not only to focus on individuals, but also 
to create an environment which allows them to do what they want to do. The webinar is really timely and relevant. This webinar will allow us to navigate new and fresh per perspectives on how we should approach and view the aging process. The series will run through three Saturdays for the month of September, starting today, September 12. It will provide us an avenue to learn from internationally and nationally recognized experts on how we should prepare ourselves and our loved ones on the path of becoming super seniors and how we could uh, empower the Filipino elderly when it comes to their rights and privileges. This webinar series also provides a suitable platform where we could exchange and share ideas to facilitate the realization of our ultimate goal, a Filipino society of empowered seniors. Before I end, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the Far Eastern University led by Dr. Michael Alba and our Lady of Fatima University led by Dr. Carolyn Marian Enriquez who co-organized this webinar together with all the officials and staff of MMHRDC headed by Dr. Hilton Lam, the Director of the Institute of Health Policy and Development Studies, National Institutes of Health, UP Manila. Thank you for making this important event a reality. I would also like to extend my sincerest appreciation to PCHRD and CHED, our most valued partners in health research and development. To all the participants, please fasten your seatbelt and enjoy the ride as we navigate the exciting landscape of the aging process and the road to society of super seniors. Magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Thank you very much, Dr. Kutyonko de La Paz. And now let's have our messages from our uh, esteemed colleagues from the, the lead convener of the MMHRDC and a chancellor of the University of the Philippines, Manila. Let's, let us all welcome Dr. Carmencita de Padilla. Good day to all participants, speakers, organizers, and guests. In behalf of the member institutions and as Metro Manila Health Research Development Consortium lead convener, I welcome you to the virtual edition of the MMHRDC International Symposium and 11th Annual Scientific Conference being hosted by the Far Eastern University. I commend the MMHRDC for pushing through with this symposium earlier slated for May 28 to 29 this year but sidelined by the pandemic. The postponement enabled more participants from here and abroad, giving way to increased interaction for exchange of knowledge and experiences. Amidst this pandemic, the consortium is committed to continue its role in disseminating relevant researches to the science community through this webinar series. The theme, The Road to Super Seniors, The Science of Aging, It's Earlier Than You Think, But It's Never Too Late, is relevant and urgent as it is timely and auspicious. 10 speakers on a wide range of topics and about 500 participants from different countries, institutions, and disciplines is quite a harvest of ideas and inputs that will benefit plans and programs for the aging sector. As the population of the Philippines and the rest of the world continues to age, there is a need to align our health and social systems to this demographic shift. The World Health Organization projects that by 2020, the number of people aged 60 years and older will outnumber children younger than five years old. By 2050, 80% of older people will be living in low and middle income countries, while the proportion of the world's people aged 60 years and older will almost double from 12% in 2015 to 22%. The Philippines is about to experience this increase in its aging population. We know that aging is an inevitable and challenging process, so we have to recognize its demands and prepare adequately. Let us reverse the notion that older persons are a burden. Rather, healthy older persons can still fulfill important roles in society. 
The World Health Organization Global Strategy and Action Plan on Aging and Health acknowledges that many older people will experience very significant losses, whether of physical or cognitive capacity, or of family, friends, and the roles they played earlier in life. Societal responses to aging should not deny these difficulties, but seek to foster recovery, adaptation, and dignity. This will require transformative approaches that recognize the rights of older people and enable them to thrive in the complex, changing, and unpredictable environment they are likely to live in now and in the future. These approaches must foster the ability of older people to, to make multiple contributions in an environment that respects their dignity and human rights free from gender and age-based discrimination. Maintaining optimal health while aging is not easy. With an already burdened health system, addressing the needs and conditions of this sector is extremely challenging. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought out further vulnerabilities of, age, of the aged and aging persons. Research is an effective way by which the academe can commit to the global strategy and action plan on aging that focuses on developing age-friendly environments and providing measurements and monitoring. UP Manila as the country's health sciences center has research such as this at its core. We therefore welcome this webinar series as an encouraging stride to highlight the researches and collaboration done on this theme. The knowledge and information generated will assist policymakers and government leaders in planning for additional services as a result of expected growth in the number of older persons. We cannot have it any other way. The time is now to focus on the health needs and challenges of the aging sector. The time is now to plan for health programs and services in our goal of envisioning a future where aging persons can still be healthy and productive contributors to society. I pray that you will have the most fruitful discussion and sharing in all of the sessions. A pleasant good morning to all. Thank you, UP Chancellor Dr. Padilla. Now the lead convener, MMHRDC, and the director of the National Capital Region Office from the Department of Science and Technology. Let us welcome Engineer R.D. Jose Patarinho Jr. Um, the third. We extend our warmest congratulations to the Metro Manila Health Research and Development Consortium for this webinar series on the road to super seniors the science of aging. We commend the members of the MMHRDC for studies that tackle productive aging. This webinar series serves as a tribute to the prime years of the aging population, telling us that it is early that you think, but it's never too late. The series will discuss science-based approaches on the different aspects of growing older and age. There is a continuing need to focus the lenses of research and development to vulnerable groups such as the aging population. We urge our researchers to consider the patterns of change and transition that the elderly goes through as they age. Likewise, we urge our policymakers to integrate RMD outputs and crafting frameworks and plans in improving the elderly's common cognitive and physical health. Most importantly, provide quality health care while reducing health care costs. May we also share that DOSD NCR has senior citizen groups provided with assistance for livelihood productivity. Aside from doing R&D, we can also transfer science-based knowledge products by collaborating with local government units and non-government organizations. We are one with you in focusing SFD efforts to benefit the elderly. Again, our warmest congratulations. Now from the OIC Director 4 of the Metro Manila Center for Health Development of the Department of Health, let us welcome Dr. Corazon I. Flores. Magandang araw po sa ating lahat. 
sa ating pong organizer ng webinar series na to, sa ating pong mga participants. Sana po'y nasa mabuti kayong kalagayan at wala, mang, wala namang iniindang anumang karamdaman. Ngayon po, araw na to, nagkakaroon tayong tinatawag na webinar series, The Road to Super Seniors, The Science of Aging. It is earlier than you think, but it is never too late. Super Seniors. Ano po bang ibig sabihin natin ito? Ito po yung tinatawag natin lahat tayong nagnanais naman na mas humaba pa ang buhay. The super seniors are those beyond 80 years old. At tayo, alam ko naman po, nalulungko tayo pagka na may nabalitaan tayo na may mga ma wala pang 30, wala pang 40 na matay na po inatake. And ngayon pong araw na to, tayong lahat ay may matututunan, marami po tayong matutunan sa tinatawag nating webinar series na to. And we at the Department of Health, Metro Manila Center for Health Development are one with the Metro Manila Health Research Development Consortium with their vision of addressing issues such as this towards the achievement of health goals that are of local, national, and international significance. This time, we are addressing a battle against time, against faded youth, and things there in between. We're battling that time kung saan po mas gusto po natin mas humaba pa ang buhay ng bawat isa. At present, of course, alam naman natin lahat, we're battling against COVID-19. We are battling against epidemic. Napakadalas po yan. Last year, meron tayong mga tinawag na uh, measles, uh, leptospirosis, polio. But of course, the battle against aging. Kung baga, pagka na, lalo na sa mga babae, pagka na ng 40s, nagkakaroon na lang mga depression o nalulungkot na siya dahil lalo na pagka may mga kulubot na. Alam niyo naman po, sa ating mga kabayihan na balidoso, gusto po natin ma-preserve ang ating kagandahan. I'm glad, of course we're glad, that it's never too, too late for us to tackle this topic. And ay alam ko po, you as our participants, Your presence in this uh, webinar is an indicator of your interest to do much for this uh, aging problem that we are facing now. And of course, alam po natin lahat, tayong lahat tatanda rin. And what we are learning here will be of great help, not only for us, but for our families and loved ones. Kaya po, tayo po lahat ay makinig ng mabuti dito po sa webinar series na to. With a variety of topics offered in this webinar, with so much anticipation, I am thrilled that the insights from our resource speakers will further concretize our very foundation and be instrumental in expanding our rates of influence. Allow me to express my early congratulations to the Metro Manila Research and Development Team. Of course, maraming salamat din po sa ating pong mga partners, co-organizing institution, Far Eastern University, and the, of course, Our Lady of Patima University for such a brilliant idea of putting this into action. This is a worthwhile experience for all of us to continuously learn something new on how we can further uh, grow to improve, to improve our, what we can do further to have a longer life for everyone. And of course, it's my wish that the road to super seniors be galvanized into action in Metro Manila, if not for the whole archipelago. A simple tip that we have to put into our mind to live a sim um, a longer and of course satisfied life take time of course to pray to meditate to give thanks to what we have received to exercise to have a good diet and lastly my prayer for everyone is taken from psalms 91 verse 16 i pray that all of us will experience a long and satisfied life magandang hap araw po sa ating lahat now to give the message, the director of the from the director of um, Commission in Higher Education in the National Capital Region, let's let us all welcome Dr. Virginia Akiate. To the organizers of the Metro Manila Health Research and Development Consortium, its officers, its members. The participating higher education institutions, especially the Far Eastern University and the Our Lady of Fatima University, who are sponsoring 
this series of webinars. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to one and all. Your theme for today, the, word, the Road to Super Seniors, the Science of Aging, is a very appropriate one. It's earlier than you think, but it's never too late. It is very timely in these times when the senior populace is suddenly increasing. It is also for this reason that we from the Commission on Higher Education, National Capital Region, endorse on September 1, 2020, this series of webinars, especially to our higher education institutions who have graduate schools because most of the professors there are seniors. Talking about seniors and seniority, I still remember the time when I was on, a, on an air bus, air conditioned bus bound to Baguio. Because I was a chance passenger, I did not get my ticket yet. I happened to be seated to a senior lady who also just entered and she too is a chance passenger. After a few minutes, the conductor of the bus came near and asked the senior lady, are you a senior? To my surprise, this lady suddenly got angry and strongly retorted. Bakit? Mukhang matanda ba ako? And looking at the very bewildered poor conductor, I proudly approached him and I said, I am a senior. The conductor then showed me to a very nice seat in front and even gave me a 20% discount. The senior lady retorted again and she said, Hindi naman hamak na mas matanda ako sa kanya. Bakit mo pa siya dinala doon sa mas magandang upuan habang ako naman andito? I look at her humbly and I said, here is my ID. I am a senior. Whether, my dear friends, whether we are mistaken as not yet senior or already seniors, let's be proud that we have reached this stage and let us be happy because this time we are already enjoying the perks of seniority. With the 20% discount, with the different allowances, and with, uh, you know, the added uh, uh, taxes are already being removed from us. So, it is for this reason, my dear friends, especially to the seniors, that I am happy to share to you the tips of being a productive and happy senior. I took it from the acronym Senior Aging, S-E-N-I-O-R. And aging, A G E I N G. So to start with, letter S, be spiritual. S, be spiritual. Always acknowledge that there is this Almighty Father guiding us day and night. Smile and say good things to people. Letter E, Embrace the good vibes. 
throw away bitterness in your life. There is no time to grudge, to pout, to be negative. In these pandemic times, let's embrace the good vibes and make things look positive. Letter M, network with other people. Do not ignore people, network with them and be happy. Letter I, inspire others instead of insulting them. Inspire others instead of insulting them. And letter R, remember the good times. Do not forget your past happy moments. According to some psychologists, they say that the farther you can remember your happy moments in your childhood, maybe when you are two, you are three or four years old, the most likely that you will not be experiencing Alzheimer's or the loss of memory. So, senior, now we come to aging. Aging. A. Add spices to your life. Do Zumba, go out with friends, and be comfortable with those that you really want to go out with. Letter G. Give to charity. Be compassionate to the needy. Be compassionate to the poor. Letter E. As I have said earlier, enjoy every minute as if it is your last. Enjoy every minute as if it is your last to stay on earth. Letter I again. Involve others to good, good, good work. Involve others to do good work. Letter M. Nurture your skills and talents and share it to others. Try doing artwork. Try embroidery. Try other things. Try to compose poetry or poems and sing a lot. Letter G, go out and serve. As seniors, we have to be doing extension work. We have to join civic organizations. We have to do volunteer work as much as we can. My dear friends, especially my dear seniors, by them and only them, can we say that we are on the road for super positive-minded seniors, ever loving, ever caring, ever inspiring to other seniors, and ever prayerful. Keep safe, my dear friends. Mabuhay tayong lahat. Mabuhay ang Metro Manila Health and Research and uh, mabuhay ang Manila Metro Manila Health and Research and Development Consortium mabuhay tayong lahat thank you po we have one more message from the executive director of the Philippine Council for Health Research and Development let us all welcome Dr. Jaime C. Montoya. I would like to congratulate the Metro Manila Health Research and Development Consortium for the successful launch of this webinar series. As COVID-19 could use to pose a great deal of challenges towards the way we do health research, this event is proof of our commitment to bring solutions closer to our communities. The theme the road to super seniors, the science of aging, it's earlier than you think, but it's never too late, highlights the value of creating equitable and inclusive access to healthcare 
and improving the quality of life in our country for all ages. According to the Commission on Population in 2019, approximately 8.2% of Filipinos are senior citizens. As our population grows older, it is even more relevant that we work for the development of evidence-based policies and programs that will ensure better lives for our elderly. As an avenue for shared learning, we hope that this event will also boost opportunities for collaborations and network building. We hope that even more researchers will join us in our mission of providing equitable access to health care for our senior citizens and our communities. Allow me again to thank the Metro Manila Health Research and Development Consortium for organizing this event, despite the challenges, and for being our partner in pursuing health and health-related activities that are attuned to the needs of our communities. Cheers to a vibrant research community for better health care and for better lives. Maraming salamat po at mabuhay po tayong lahat. Thank you very much again, the Executive Director of the PCHRD. And now to deliver the inspirational message for this morning's um, Symposium in Scientific Cons, we have live with us this morning, the Director 3 <laughs> of the International Affairs Staff of the Commission on Higher Education, let us, give, let us give a big round of virtual applause for attorney Lili Freda M. Milia. Dr. Carmen Sita Padilla, lead convener of the Metro Manila Health Research Development Consortium and Chancellor of UP Manila. To Dr. Eva Maria Cuchanco de La Paz, steering committee chair of the MMHRDC, the executive director of the National Institute of Health, the University of the Philippines, Manila. Dr. Jaime Montoya, executive director of the Philippine Council for Health Research and Development. Dr. Hilton Lam, um, also from the UP Manila, Dr. Maria Luisa Enriquez, scientist in residence of uh, De La Salle University, Manila, Dr. Michael Jose Dino, the director for the Center for Research, Development, and Innovation of Our Lady of Fatima University, Dr. Generoso Pamitan Jr., the director of the University of, of uh, Research for Far Eastern University, such illustrious names and leaders in the field of health research in the country. And to all the health professionals, allied health professionals, researchers, academicians, students from both members and non-member institutions of the MMHRDC and other uh, health consortium, magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Ched commends the MMHRDC for pushing through with this webinar series despite the challenges brought about by the pandemic and with the objectives being met by providing an opportunity to learn from local and international experts and practitioners and to provide an avenue for international exchange of ideas and research findings on the various topics here. Chad recognizes the valuable contribution of the MMHRDC in flourishing health research and expansion of knowledge network on health and leading and in addressing the concerns on the research agenda involving health. The model of collaboration likewise affirms the value of shared visions and goals that by building consortium, it can scale capacities and expand opportunities and benefits to its member institutions through opportunities for strengthening research capacities, mentoring, twinning arrangement, complementation and sharing of resources, access to various human resource and institutional development plans, as well as collaborative opportunities through local and international linkages. Today, we will be learning more from the experts on the opportunity, the right, and the challenges on the road to super seniors, the science of aging. It's earlier than you think, but it's never too late. The World Health Organization said 
that our society is measured by how it cares for its elderly citizens. You can see rising from 66 to 73, the Philippines has more senior citizens now and in fact, uh, the majority of them are needing to remain happy and healthy. While there are many challenges in supporting an aging population, it's essential also to be reminded that it's time to celebrate their wisdom and uniqueness. And for me, I'm not yet senior, but nearing, I believe in the saying that the longer I live, the more beautiful life becomes. And allow me also to borrow the quote from Samuel Ullman, said that nobody grows old merely by living a number of years. We grow old by deserting our ideals. Years may wrinkle, this, may wrinkle the skin, but to give up enthusiasm wrinkles the soul. So we never really grow old. We hope to continue the engagement with MMHRDC as CHED joins you in your aspirations to promote greater health research and development in the premier region of the country by building platforms for the development of human resource in health research and the expansion of research, dissemination, and utilization with your leadership and management. It is through our collective and collaborative effort in a meaningful framework through the pursuit of research, innovation, and development for an equitable, healthier, peaceful, and better world for everyone. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. I wish you all a very successful and very enlightening webinar series. So as we, before we proceed with the actual webinar series, we'd like to congratulate the organizers. We have almost 400 delegates and participants for this morning's webinar series. And I believe everyone is very much excited to listen to the lectures and the different uh, scientific symposia. So to begin with, with the introduction uh, of the webinar series, next slide, please. So we'd like to, uh, we'd like to give a big shout out to all the hardworking people who are responsible and behind this successful endeavor from the various academic institutions. So allow me to go over them one by one. Dr. Nuna Almanzor, Dr. Remedios Fernandez, Dr. Erna Yabut, Dr. Avelina Raqueño, Ms. Liza Libertine Magana, Dr. Maria and Ms. Candy Ramos. And of fair, Dr. Generoso Pamitan, Sherry Maramag, Dr. Michael Baklig, Ms. Catherine Romero, Associate Professor Michael George Peralta, Dr. Jennifer Niles, and of course, Dr. Hilton Lamb. So, um, next slide, please. So we also like to acknowledge the, the team behind the successful webinar series uh, for the webinar and creatives. We'd like to acknowledge the team from the Our Lady of Fatima University with Dr. Michael, Michael Joseph Dino, Mr. Chris Patricio, and Mr. Joseph Carlo Vital. From the program committee, we have Dr. Generoso Pamitan, Professor Joycelyn Filoteo, and uh, Dr. Maria Luisa Enriquez. Also, we have from Manila Central University, Dr. Vina Solar, uh, Dr. Josephine De Leon, Dr. Rudolf Simer Kirby Martinez, and yours truly, Dr. Javier. And from the evaluation committee, uh, Ms. Cherry Maramag. And now we will formally begin our morning session. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our speakers for this morning's webinar. We have a panel of highly esteemed speakers, and I'll begin by introducing our first speaker for this morning. 
Our speaker was born and raised in Bohol. She earned her Doctor of Medicine degree from the Romualdus Trinidad Medical Foundation in Tacloban City in 1989. She has been with the Department of Health for 27 years, which started way back in 1993 when she volunteered in Pasil Kalinga as one of the doctors to the barrios. After her stint at the DTTB program, she was assigned to the malaria section as training officer. As part of her career development, she later on pursued postgraduate studies, specifically Master of Science in Community Health and Health Management in developing countries at the prestigious University of Heidelberg in Germany. She also worked as the program manager of the National Rabies Prevention and Control from 2000 to 2007, after which she was assigned as mental health coordinator prior to her designation as the national coordinator of the Adolescent Health and Development Program. Recently, she was appointed as the National Program Manager of the Healthy Aging Program of the Department of Health. She likewise underwent various specialty trainings and short courses locally and internationally, and in 2006, she completed her diploma course in gerontology and geriatrics. As a lifelong learner, our speaker has been actively involved in medical research. She has served as principal investigator to several epidemiologic investigations and clinical trials conducted locally and abroad. Her research interests include rabies prevention and control, and she has completed malaria studies in Punjab province in Pakistan. Our speaker is happily married and, and has been blessed with one loving child. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give a big round of virtual applause to Dr. Rosa Minerva Ovin Luan. Okay, good morning. Good morning. I hope all are safe and well amid COVID-19 pandemic. It is a great pleasure being invited in this prestigious activity, the fourth MMR HRDC International Symposium and 11th Annual Scientific Conference. Thank you organizers for, I would say, best chance and venue to advocate health healthy and productive aging program of the Department of Health. Allow me also to acknowledge the different societies, government and non-government stakeholders who participated in the crafting of the HPAP plan I am going to present. I may not mention the groups now, but later in my presentation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, senior citizens defined by Republic Act 9994 as any person aged 60 years or over and is comprised 7.5% or 7.55 million of the total population based on PSA 2015. Next slide, please. Almost all or 99.8 are in households and only 0.2% are in, in institutions. Among the senior citizens of household populations, 42.1% are gainful workers, usually in agriculture, forestry, or in fisheries. And 22.3% are pensioners, about 21% are housekeepers in their own house, uh, and about 15% are dependents. Next slide, please. Okay. The 2018 Longitudinal Study of Aging and Health in the Philippines by Cruz describes the health status and well-being of Filipinos aged 60 years and over assessing determinants of health among senior citizens. Most older Filipinos have average self-rated health. Of the diagnosed diseases, hypertension has the highest prevalence. Among the diseases recognizable to senior citizens, even without medical diagnosis, the most common cited are arthritis and cataract. More than a fourth of older Filipinos are completely edentulous. Next slide, please. 
almost a third of population aged 60 and older experience severe disability. And more than fifth of senior citizens have difficulty of performing at least one of the seven activities of daily living. Like taking a bath, dressing, or eating, or standing up from bed or chair, or sitting down on a chair, or walking around the house, go out or leaving the house, or using the toilet. About one in four admitted have difficulty of performing at least instrumental activity of daily living like preparing own meals but the most is the most they admitted is that they have difficulty of taking a bus or a, a public transport to leave home about 3 in 10 senior citizens feel ill in the past 12 months and thought of going to the doctor but did not well there are many reasons for not seeking help at the time, and the most common is lack of financial means. The study also shows 8% of senior citizens are receiving care because of a continuing health condition and are thus classifiable as receiving long-term care. Practically, all require daily care. Next slide, please. About seven and 10 senior citizens diagnosed with hypertension are taking medis medications. Among them, a third receive their free medications from health center. Next slide, please. An analysis on the global burden of disease, injuries and risk factors, or GBD, study in 2016, GBD, 2016 Dementia Collaborators 2019 places the global estimate of number of individuals who live with dementia at about 44 million. And GDB estimates that between 1990 and 2016, there would have been 14 or 15,000 deaths in the Philippines. And there would have been 360 persons about oh, 360,000 persons with dementia. Next, please. Allow me to show the policies, or these are several policies that support persons with geriatric issues in the country. Okay. National Healthy and Productive Aging Program. Each pop or the Healthy and Productive Aging Program aims to achieve the following vision, mission, and goal. Having, having this, the objectives are providing senior citizens with comprehensive health service package and integrated continuum of care, development of standards for senior citizen-friendly environment in health facilities, Continuously improve the quality of health programs for senior citizens. Enhance the capacity of health workers to implement the health programs for senior citizens. The fifth is establishing and maintaining a data management system and conduct researches for the development of evidence-based health policies. And the sixth or the last is strengthen partnership with other government agencies, NGOs, and other stakeholders working for or with senior citizens. Next, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Each pop or the each pop is lodged at the Disease Prevention and Control Bureau and headed by the National Program Coordinator, tasked to perform technical and administrative functions. It collaborates other programs of the Department of Health, 
that are essential to healthy and productive aging. These programs shall include in their strategic plans, key indicators and strategies indicated to healthy and productive aging. Next slide, please. Central to the program is the strategic goal defined as to improve health status of aging Filipinos. And it has four core strategies. Number one is health promotion, which involves activities aimed at, the, at enabling people to take control over and improve their health. The second core strategy is disease prevention, and it includes prevention and management of the conditions that are particularly common in individuals as they age, like the non-communicable diseases. Prevention refers to both primary, like avoidance of tobacco use, or as well as secondary, like screening for early detection of chronic diseases, or tertiary, as appropriate clinical management of diseases that contribute to reducing the risk of disabilities. Curative services is the third core strategies that we have, which call for a renewed effort to increase affordable access to essential safe medication and to better ensure the appropriate cost-effective use of current and new drugs and also making referrals to the secondary, tertiary levels of care where most acute and emergency care is needed. And our last core strategies is long-term care, which is we or which includes both formal or informal support system. Formal support system may range of community services, as well as institutional care in nursing homes and, and hospices. To implement these strategies effectively, the country's health system will readily, will ready to provide AIDS-friendly health services. This health system components includes policy and governance, service delivery, logistics, financing, strategic information and e money, health workforce and regulation. As I said, these are our core strategies. The health promotion, this is prevention, curative services and long-term care. Next slide, please. Okay. In order to achieve the goal of each pap, specific actions will be made to respond to geriatric health issues, including dementia. Next slide, please. Contributing to the each pap vision of, the, of a society with healthy and productive senior citizens who continue to contribute to the betterment of the society, this action plan, final outcome, will be seniors, citizens, enjoying quality of life in all domains, physical, psychological, social relations, and environment. And the, our indicator is that decreased proportion of older persons surveyed who self-report finding it difficult to perform at least one of the following or of this mentioned IADL due to their health or physical state. Next slide, please. Consistent with the HPAP mission to ensure that all EC have access to comprehensive health healthcare and services and a senior citizen friendly in environment and goal to improve the health status of senior citizen and enable them to fully enjoy the right to health. This action plan targets four intermediate outcomes. And these intermediate outcomes are age-friendly cities and communities, strategic information and research, 
Rest reduction, service delivery, which has four components. Next slide, please. The intermediate outcome A, which is age-friendly cities and communities, age-friendly cities and communities are where older persons are treated with respect and are able to exercise the full range of human rights, free from abuse and discrimination from family members, health professionals, and general public. Our outputs here are the policies like the manual of operation that we are supposed to, actually we are supposed to do it this year, but due to COVID, um, we will do this next year. Then for the multi-sectoral coalition for AIDS-friendly cities. Next, please. Okay. The intermediate outcome B is information and research. HPAP will collaborate with DOH, Epidemiology Bureau and Knowledge Management Information and Technology Service, and the Philippines on senior citizen, health status, service use, and dementia care, including statistics from private clinics. Depending on discussion, HPAP indicators may be incorporated into the existing information system, such as the homes or IC clinics, I clinics. Likewise, in collaboration with DOST, PCHRD, the academy, and other stakeholders, HPAP will develop a list of priorities that are most relevant to the program, and recognizing the various initiatives of the CSOs. Each pub will build a compendium of best practices, which may be scaled up by the national programs or may be duplicated by LGUs. Each pub will also explore the feasibility of designating a depository of local researches. Next, please. Okay. Our intermediate outcome C is prevention and rest reduction. Our first output here is health promotion and communication. Senior citizens need to manage their own health in order to contribute to society. They need health literacy and behavioral change. With the participations of stakeholders, the Department of Health, Health Promotion and Communication Service will lead the development of comprehensive health promotion and communication plan for its pub. Our second output is the community-based preventive gerontology programs. Each pub will convene geriatrics and gerontology experts, senior citizens, and other stakeholders to develop a manual for establishing community-based preventive gerontology programs. This will be piloted in three cities and one province in 2021. As of now, we are still on hold due to this present pandemic. Next, please. HPAP aims to modify certain risk factors contributing to geriatric health issues, including dementia. And these are the list of potentially modifiable risk factors under baseline values from the longitudinal study of aging in the Philippines by UPPI DRDF, the fit for frail UPNIH, the National Disability Prevalence Survey, and other national surveys. Next, please. The fourth intermediate outcome. In, service, in, in services for senior citizens and their carers. These are programs and services for the diagnosis, treatment, care, and support of the senior citizens with dementia and other diseases requiring long-term care. This also includes caring for the health and well-being of carers and families of persons with dementia. 
preventing carer fatigue and providing services such as psychological counseling for carers. The services for senior citizens includes geriatric screening, comprehensive geriatric assessment, advanced care, planning, advanced care planning, long-term care, palliative care, and emergency preparedness and response for senior citizens. Each pop will, will be incorporated in ongoing uh, strengthening of the universal health care system, and this includes the local health care provider network, which should include multidisciplinary team to address the complex health issues of senior citizens and capability building of medical and allied medical workers. Depending on the services to be provided, provided by the medical and allied medical professionals, the level of care, the following training packages shall be included. Geriatric screening, the dementia toolkit for community workers, the MH gap, the community-based preventive gerontology, age sensitivity, advanced care planning, long-term care, palliative care, community-based dementia care and medical rehabilitation, and care for carers. Actually, it, it's in our work plan for the, uh, to conduct training of trainers this year. Our training, training modules are already approved by our training office and ready to start but due to COVID-19 pandemic, an online training is, is conceptualized and hopefully training, training shall be conducted before the year ends. Next slide, please. Third HPOP service incorporated into universal healthcare system is enhancing health, health facilities to meet quality standards for older persons. To date, we have 32 DOH retained hospitals and LGUs meeting the standards. And the fourth service we hope to be incorporated into universal healthcare system is fair health packages for acute and chronic care for dementia. Next, please. And lastly, the most important support services for senior citizens under and their cares is services for carers and families that includes building the capacity of skills and skills of informal carers to care for persons with dementia, screening for caregiver burden and appropriate referrals, and community-based support network for carers and families. We plan to have three pilot sites and in 2021 in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Before I end my presentation, may I acknowledge the actors of this plan. The DOH and the WHO Philippines are grateful for the participation of the government and non-government stakeholders in the crafting of this plan. The PCGM or the Philippine College of Geriatric Medicine, the PCGG or Philippine College of Geriatric Gerontology, the Alzheimer's Disease Association of the Philippines, the Dementia Society of the Philippines, Gerontology Nurses Association of the Philippines, the Philippine Academy of Rehabilitation Medicine, Philippine Neurological Association, the Philippine Academy of Family Physicians, Fragility Fracture Network Philippines, the Philippines Association of Speech Pathologists, Philippine Association of Occupational Therapists, Association of Municipal Health Officers of the Philippines, the Association of DOH Retired Employees, COSI or the Coalition of Services for uh, Elderly Individuals, 
Federation of Older Persons Association of the Philippines, Office of the Senior uh, Affairs, Pasay City, Alliance of Fili Filipino Families for Mental Health, Philippine Mental Health Association Institute of Aging, University of the Philippines National Institute of Health, University of Manila College of Allied Medical Profession, the Department of Social Wel uh, Welfare and Development, the National Council on Disability Affairs, the Department of Trade and Industry, the National Center for Geriatric Health, the National Center for Mental Health, and Pusil Reyes Memorial Medical Center, Department of Geriatrics. Thank you and good day, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Minerva Vinluan from the Department of Health. So at this point, we'd like to remind our, uh, our delegates that if you have any questions for our uh, speakers, you can use the question and answer chat box, or you can also post your inquiries uh, in our Facebook live streaming account. Uh, kindly indicate your full name and your academic in affiliation if you are going to post questions for our speaker. And to start off the question and answer portion in the open forum, allow me to introduce our moderators for the open forum. First, we have a prof professorial lecturer from the Graduate School of Nursing of the Arellano University. Let's all welcome Dr. Rudolph Seymour Kirby Martinez. And our next moderator is a faculty and coordinator for community research from the School of Nursing from the Central Escolar University. We have Dr. Josephine De Leon. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello to all participants. Thank you, Dr. Bin Luan, for that uh, very good uh, presentation. So our first question from Iris Bernardo of Philippine uh, PUP. So according to he, according to Ms. Bernardo, uh, the question is why are there different health policies for senior citizens in different cities? Is it, isn't it all LGU should have the same for all? Dr. Bin Luan. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Um, may I repeat the question, please? Uh, according to um, Ms. Ms. Bernardo, why are there different health policies for senior citizens in the different cities? Isn't it all LGU should have the same for all? I guess uh, she is talking about the, the pilot cities that you will be um, developing in, in 2021 and still on hold right now. The question is why there are different policies? Yes, 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 ma'am. Okay. Um, we our guidelines from the central office. Now, when it goes down to the local government, they are making another ordinances or mm -hmm. they are drafting ordinances for their constituents. Oh, However, so this, these guidelines okay. actually, these guidelines actually are um, some sort of guide for them, but it should not be outside of what we want to happen. Okay, ma'am. Uh, in relation to, to the question, uh, uh, you mentioned with your presentation that you also have the, you will be having one outcome and that is prevention and reduction to the different cities. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, where would be the funding coming from and how about the facilities? Is it coming from the local government unit? For the, excuse me? Yes, Dr. Binluan, um, regarding yes. the question for, yes. for the different cities, development of different cities, in regards to prevention and risk reduction outcomes, uh, where will be the funding coming from and the facilities of different cities? Is it coming from uh, the LGU or the local go government units? It could be from the local government or from the central office. Maybe you can, you, uh, the local government uh, will request um, assistance from the Department of Health because we have, as far as I know, we have an HP program 
that is responsible for the, for example, um, for the development of our uh, health facilities, improving health facilities, uh, HPIP can handle for that. Uh, so what we are going to advise is uh, they will just um, coordinate with the regional, uh, regional health offices, uh, submit any proposals. Okay, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Martinez, you have questions? Hello, good, good morning. So this is a question from an anonymous commenter from Facebook. This question is, there was no specific mention of palliative care provision to elderly individual. Are there any program which focuses on palliative care or end of life? From those that you have presented, Dr. Vinuan? From end of, uh, excuse me? Uh, are there life. any specific program that uh, includes palliative care or end of life? We are still on the process of uh, developing. Uh, we are still on the process of, uh, uh, court, court, uh, I mean, meeting or uh, developing uh, such. Um, what's this? Um, developing uh, a manual or uh, guidelines with regards to end of life, actually. Um, actually, this, um, what I am presenting uh, today is um, a plan that we are going to, uh, to do for until 2022. And then um, together with uh, different societies, together with the different experts, we are coming up with a uh, with a guideline or a policy uh, uh, to come up with a policy or a guideline for uh, regarding uh, end of life uh, provision. Okay, thank you. There is another. Actually, we don't have still. Uh, we, we, uh, as of now, we, we don't have uh, that program yet. Uh, so there's no specific program at the moment. No, not yet. So yet. It's still in the creation because the commenter was also saying that. A uh, peaceful dying is also part of healthy well-being. Yeah. Okay. And there's another one from Donald Lipardo from UST. So his question is, if we have a program for older persons, how can we apply for research grant or funding? Okay. Um, if you have a proposal, you just submit it for... Uh, uh, you just submit it to the Department of Health because we have we have an evaluation team or a proposal evaluation team at the Health uh, Planning Health Policy and Planning Development Bureau. So, if the proposal that you send to us are the priority or the uh, under the uh, under the list of our priorities, we can consider for a possible funding. Okay, thank you for that clarification, Dr. Binduan. Ma'am Josephine, I have no question on, on yes, my thank side you. of the world. Yes, so Dr. Binduan, so this will be the last question. Um, regarding the, one of the outcomes again, for prevention and risk reduction, um, is there a plan of training the local government units in terms of prevention and uh, control or gerontology, uh, preventive gerontology problem? Yeah, uh, actually, um, we have we have we have done our um, training manual, mm -hmm. uh, training modules for uh, for our local government. That is. Um, that is a geriatric training manual for our primary health care providers. And luckily, it just happened that uh, um, because of the there pandemic. was uh, this pandemic. That's why we were not able to train them face-to-face. Uh, uh, -face. But uh, based on the information that we got uh, from the HHRDB, they are coming up with an online they are conceptualizing an online training for our healthcare providers. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Binluan. Yes, Dr. Javier. 
Thank you very much once again to Dr. Minerva O. Vinduan of the Department of Health. May I call now to the stage Dr. Generoso Pamitan, Director of, uh, Director of the University Research Center of the Far Eastern University to award the e-certificate to our uh, esteemed speaker for this morning. Dr. Pamitan? Good morning. MMHRDC is uh, honored to award the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Minerva Ovin Luan. The certificate reads, Metro Manila Health Research and Development Consortium in cooperation with Far Eastern University and Our Lady of Fatima University <coughs> present the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Minerva Ovin Luan for exhibiting exemplary knowledge and, and competence as speaker in the webinar the Road to Super Seniors, The Science of Aging, uh, given uh, this uh, 12th day of September 2020. Thank you, Dr. Minerva Ovin Lua. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bamitan and Dr. Minerva Ovin Lua. And again, a big round of applause for our esteemed speaker. For our next webinar session, we will be having two panelists. So allow me to introduce to you our two panelists before we formally turn over the, the, the stage to them. Our second speaker for this morning is a senior research fellow and leads the Substance Use and Mental Health Group at the Institute for Social Science Research at the University of Queensland in Australia. She is also an adjunct senior lecturer at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Center at the University of New South Wales and a research fellow of the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for Children and Families over the life course. Until 2018, our speaker was a research fellow with the Institute for Social Science, uh, Social Science Research and the Queensland Center for Mental Health Research. She obtained her Doctor of Philosophy in Public Health from the University of Queensland in 2015. And she earned her degree of Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry and Genetics from the Australian National University. Likewise, she has a Diploma of Community Service Management from the Southback Institute of Technology and a Certificate in IV Training and Assessment from the Metropolitan South Institute of TAFE. Our speaker was the former director of the Center for Addiction Research and Education at the Drug ARM Austral Asia, a leading non-government organization. Her research endeavors focus on the interactions among substance abuse, mental and physical health, and social disadvantage across the life cycle. Her previous background in molecular biology and medicine provides a unique perspective on gene X environment issues. Our speaker brings extensive practical and research experience working with young people and their families in the areas of mental health, risk-taking behaviors, and social disadvantage. She has an impressive record of collaborative research management and leadership of large and complex projects across multidisciplinary teams. She, she has led and delivered research with sensitive populations, has demonstrated capability with quantitative and qualitative methodologies, and has significant knowledge on community and service sectors. Let's give a big round of applause. From the Institute of Social Science Research, University of Queensland, we have Dr. Caroline Salem. And together with Dr. Salem is our third speaker who graduated cum laude and was a salutatorian of class 2012 of the Institute of Nursing Far Eastern University. He later on pursued a degree Doctor of Philosophy in Epidemiology from the University of Queensland in Australia. He was a recipient of an international scholarship from the same institution from 2015 to 2019. Despite his young age, our speaker is no neophyte in the field of research, having extensive epidemiologic investigations and academic undertakings. He has published 35 peer-reviewed articles, eight on adolescent health, eight on mental health, and 11 on big data step analytics. He has completed nine conference papers and has been invited as keynote speaker in at least seven local and international conferences and webinars. In the last five years, his works have been cited 
at least 2,286 times by scholars in 37 countries, including the US, Canada, the United Kingdom, Pakistan, South Africa, and Chile. At present, our speaker is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute for Social Science Research, University of Queensland, and at the Australian Research Council Center for Excellence for Children and Families over the life course. He is likewise an urban health survey consultant at the World Health Organization, Philippines. Our speaker is a fellow of the Royal Society of Public Health in London, United Kingdom, and he has affiliation with various international organizations, including the International Association for Adolescent Health, the Global Burden of Disease Collaborator Network, the International Epidemiological Association, and the Austral Asian Epidemiological Association. He is also a member of the Honor Society of Nursing, Sigma Theta Tau International in Indianapolis, Indiana, USA. Colleagues and friends, let us also warmly welcome Dr. Jomer Maravilla. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, good morning. I'm just sharing the screen. There you go. Thank you. Mabuhai uh, to all of you, to the distinguished guests, to the participants, and to the organizing committee. Kumusta Kayo. And there is the end of my Tagalog, so I hope you'll forgive me for not being able to say any more. <laughs> Thank you very much to the Metro Manila HRDC for inviting us to speak here today. We are very honored to join you in this uh, series of symposia. And we look forward to discussing our research with you and to entertaining your questions as we go through. Could we go to the next slide, please, Joma? It is customary for us in Australia to start any meeting or presentation with an acknowledgement of country, uh, which includes acknowledging the elders of the Aboriginal people who have shared this land with us. And that becomes even more important today as we're talking about seniors. So on behalf of Joma uh, and myself, I acknowledge the Turbal, the Jagara and the Yugambeh people as the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands from which we greet you today. On behalf of the Institute for Social Science Research, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants, and the elders in particular, past, present and emerging, who continue the cultural and spiritual connections to country that are so important for us. And we recognise their invaluable contributions to Australian and global society. So this is even more important today as we talk about seniors, and today I greet you in the language of the Yugambe people, which is the country from which I'm speaking on the Gold Coast today. And I say to you, Jingari, which means hi. So we could go to the next speed. So today we're talking about taking a life course approach to aging. Uh, and if we move forward, we know that the life course isn't a, a linear journey. It's something that happens to us that is not linear. It's not simple. It's a journey with many sidetracks. Uh, but all of the events that we encounter during that time have an effect on our health and our well-being all the way through our life, not just us, but the family and the community that surround us. So by taking a life course approach, we acknowledge that each stage individually has an impact. And these factors change over time and accumulate. So this life course approach facilitates our understanding of the factors that contribute to our healthy development from birth and even beforehand, right through to seniors and ageing. And it allows us to continue, consider the impact of the exposures to risk factors at each of these different stages of our life and how these factors accumulate and their impact grows as we go through our lifetime. So here I'd like to acknowledge a, a colleague of ours, Dr. Uh, Professor Steve Subrick at the Telephone Kids Institute in Western Australia. And this is a diagram that he's put together that shows that the important factors that influence our, our health as we go through life are not just those to individual to us. We are influenced as we go past to, uh, by our families, by our community and our society. Um, 
and these have both positive, supportive and negative or challenging impacts on us as we go through our lifetime. It's important to also note that these factors, these influences don't occur to us in isolation. There are very important relationships between all of these factors and these, inter these uh, relationships can be uh, multi-directional as well. So it becomes quite a complex environment that we need to consider as part of this. So this, this life course approach also acknowledges that change isn't constant over our lifespan. There are some stages of life that signal gradual change. So weaning during very early childhood, reaching puberty, puberty and adolescence and then progressing on to adulthood. Now these are within person changes and they're often driven by the physiological changes in our bodies over time. But there are other specific transitions like starting school, taking up our first jobs, forming our families and loss of people that we love over time. And these transitions can be more abrupt. They can be involving external influences or a shift in the environment in which these things are happening to us. And they also impact on our ability to respond to change, to develop coping mechanisms, to seek treatment and to be able to interact with the people around us in our environment. And some of these things are positive forces and some of them are negative and challenging. So with the aim of health research and healthcare is to optimise the functional capability of an individual and by taking a life course approach to ageing, by starting this very early, that enables us to look across the entire lifespan and not just a narrow window in time. So by using by considering very strongly our aim being to improve both the opportunity for well-being and to increase the life enjoyment and well-being of a person over time um, we need to consider a number of different factors so we look at the change in the capability of a person both their intrinsic capacity which as you can see from the diagram changes over time escalating from birth as to and increasing into adulthood with some intrinsic drop off of that capability over time. So if we want to improve that functional capability by understanding the challenges to health, we look to making sure that the functional ability is raised over time and is maintained at a better functional ability over a longer period of time. So to do that, we need to look at both the intrinsic capability of the person and the environment in which they operate. So this brings us to considering very importantly the social and environmental determinants of health that form the frameworks as our last speaker talked about as part of the HPAP strategic framework. So we need to consider this in our research as well as in our healthcare. And um, so that's illustrated very beautifully in the diagram that JOMA has adapted from a conceptual framework from the WHO. So by taking this life course approach to aging, we're able to look at what factors might affect the life and the well-being and the health of a person over that time, and then employ this knowledge to build on the strategies that we have for prevention. And if we invest very heavily in prevention early in life and then continue to do that. The aim is to reduce the burden on the system of healthcare so that the need for management and rehabilitation programs become lesser and so less costly to the system and provide much more of an opportunity for enjoyment of health and well-being for an individual. As well as changes that happen in the close sphere of a person, we also need to examine the wider global environment in which they live and operate. So major societal changes have very strong impacts on the health and well-being of individuals. Um, and we're in experiencing one of those right now as we're sitting in the grip of the global pandemic with COVID-19. Um, the life course approach allows us to look at all of these very large scale changes and adapt 
and see how people adapt to these dynamic characteristics of society as well as the individuals. So some of the examples we have are changes in the, the digital environment which allow us in a positive way to reach out to more people when they're geographically distant from us. Um, shifts in our educational systems have increased the health literacy of individuals but they've also increased the capacity of health systems by training newer waves of more skilled professionals uh, like all of you who are here today. We have changes in food security that might happen um, gradually over time, but also in seismic shifts in response to big events, where you have improvements in food security that bolster health, but where disparities between different communities can create stress and might lead to malnutrition. Uh, we look at issues of migration, which take people to new and unfamiliar communities, which provide challenges for them to maintain their health, but also to seek support from health systems. And then we have the major catastrophic events, which shake individuals and create trauma that affects their health and well-being, but also shake up the social and health systems that can support them and create an extra layer of challenge. So all of these challenges contribute over a person's lifespan and if we look only at one point in their lifespan, we miss so much more information than if we constrain things to that single period of life. So it's very important to consider these events that happen over the lifespan and how they impact on a person's well-being as well as just what's happening at one point. And so now I'll go, I'll hand over to Joma to discuss the next section. Thanks, Caroline. Um, so before I, um, there you go. Um, discuss my topic. I would like to share with you or tell you three hypothetical life stories. So I will start with baby girl. So baby girl was um, delivered through normal delivery, but then her mom experienced, you know, preeclampsia during pregnancy. Um, and then during childhood, infancy and childhood days, um, she received some nutritional support because of being underweight and being stunted. Fast forward a bit, um, although she was underweight back then, um, she had good healthy or healthy lifestyle as a teenager and as a young adult. And also she reported that she's receiving adequate family support. So she started working and at the age of 45, sadly her partner died. And because of that, she decided to um, retire early. And then fast forward, um, her daughter, her only daughter, also gave to another daughter. And at the age of 65, they, they decided to live together. Then another story, um, baby boy number one. So baby boy uh, was delivered normally by, her, by his mom. Um, but then during infancy and childhood, he was actually exposed to secondhand smoke because his father is a heavy smoker and sadly during his teenage years he became a heavy smoker he started smoking at the age of 14 but then good thing um, when at the age of 35 he decided to quit smoking because um, he he had a, a son and so he stopped smoking but then he stayed drinking heavily um, and he actually started at the age of 16 um, during his college days, um, but yet he stayed drinking until the age of 35 um, and forward. And sad to say, at the age of 50, he died of stroke. So as you can see, there's accumulated risk factors um, in, in the life of this person, baby boy one. Um, and then lastly, um, baby boy two. So baby boy two is a, was a preterm baby. And during, you know, infancy his mom experienced some postnatal depression that affected how his mom and um, yeah, his mom took care of him um, and then also because of some repercussions from being a preterm baby he received a couple of intensive physical interventions um, and also because of complex things happening at this stage um, his family experienced some levels of anxiety and stress and now moving forward a bit during his teenage years, he started to show some externalizing behaviors and some um, indications of mental health difficulties. And because of that, he received some mental health support, he received treatment, 
Um, and also his family received some family support and parenting um, counseling around that time. Fast forward, um, so he was able to recover through those, um, I guess, challenges. And so he was able to achieve good employment outcomes. And at the age of 40, he also started to have his own family and you know, was able to have a good family. And at the age of 60, um, he, he um, decided to retire and start to live with his only daughter and in-laws and children. So as you can see in these three stories, life stories, or we call it traje trajectories of three individuals, so you can see there are a lot of factors across life stages that really affected the outcomes or, or their outcomes at the later stage. Um, a lot of them happened at critical stages, particularly at fetal stage, um, as well as uh, during childhood, um, which then sort of could affect how they live their life during adolescent years and adulthood um, days. But then it's also important that, you know, what you're born with or what you experience during childhood is not the only answer um, to explain um, your outcomes at, during your, I guess, across aging, I would say. Um, so it's, it's really, really important for us to consider the, the family, what's happening in the family, what's happening in the, the society. Um, it's also important to look at, you know, how these risk factors or I would say um, contributing factors um, interact and affect the future outcomes of an individual. Um, so it's important for us to develop interventions that would address those risk factors. And, but then again, for us to be able to plan for these interventions, we need to understand the different risk factors, again, at each life stages, and how those factors interact with each other. And at the same time, how those factors and outcomes change over time, considering all the external factors that's happening at various levels of the society. So um, Caroline and I will discuss some of the risk factors and outcomes that's not well studied in the field of life course research, um, but they're considered to be sort of an emerging um, field of study. I will start with sexual reproductive health because that's what my, my research is mostly on. Um, and as you know, a lot of research are already in, um, particularly in the Philippines, there are already a lot of research about sexual reproductive health. But then again, as we look through the literature, there's really few evidence um, looking through the life course predictors and outcomes, particularly on sexual and reproductive health. But I, and so I will share with you some of the research that we're doing, some of the systematic reviews that we're doing um, that pertains to this particular outcome. So as we all know, maternal age can really affect an individual's um, or a pregnant woman's um, tendency to have complications during pregnancy and delivery. Um, another interesting thing that I want to share as well is that, you know, in our review, we found that breastfeeding can actually increase the likelihood of, um, of a person to consume vegetables and fruits um, during their childhood and adolescent years. Um, whereas a bottle feeding, there is some evidence indicating that, you know, those who are bottle fed, um, child tend to have poor self-regulation when they were teenagers. Another interesting research we found, um, which, which Caroline and I were able to publish in BMJ, um, we found that depression at teenage years can actually affect the decision of, um, and also the, 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 the moment that the teenager is deciding to use modern contraception at, during young adulthood and adulthood stages. Um, some of our colleagues also, moving forward a bit, some of our colleagues also found in their longitudinal study um, that you know, consumption of fruits, high consumption of fruits and Mediterranean diet can actually lessen the um, symptoms of um, menopause, those um, symptoms that usually women or older women are concerned about, so particularly hot flushes and night sweats. Um, and lastly, um, menopause, menopause can actually increase the risk of heart disease and diabetes because of the shift in weight distribution in their abdomen. So in this sort of section, you can see that there are a lot of direct health factors that affect sexual reproductive health outcomes of an individual. But then I want to move from that sort of health factors and move away a bit and look at the different social familial factors that really affects this particular outcome. So one of our 
one of our studies um, showed that an ex experiencing sexual abuse during childhood can actually increase the risk of a teenager um, to, to demonstrate risky sexual behaviors. Um, another study as well, um, we found that closeness or closeness between the mother and her daughter um, can actually reduce the chance of um, early pregnancy or teenage pregnancy. And I think in this study, um, a longitudinal study from Cebu, Philippines was used. Another one, which is, um, I think it, it also surprised us um, when you know, we found that victims of violence, um, so if you're, if you're a victim of violence during teenage years, you actually have the tendency to have an early menopause. So this is one of us, the studies of our colleagues from School of Public Health here at UQ. And all of these factors, again, can just to add a bit of complexity, a lot, a lot of these factors could also be compounded or have some interactions with the socioeconomic status of an individual. Um, and also some of the parental factors, you know, the socioeconomic status, the educational status of the parent child, um, the employment status of an individual. Also, I want us to, I want to bring you a little bit more focused, and this is sort of a, a I guess, a case that I want to discuss um, in this webinar is really focusing on, I guess, one of the longest issues that the Philippines is experiencing. Um, and you know, for decades, our, our country is really facing or battling the problem of teenage pregnancy. <clears throat> and we know that teenage pregnancy has multiple repercussions, um, such as preterm delivery. They have increased tendency to have a lot of pregnancy and labor complications. They usually have the tendency to seek for an unsafe abortion. And then because of I guess the internal stigma that the adolescent is experiencing and also the community norms or the norms within the community where she is living, um, there's a tendency for her to have poor, poor health seeking behavior. Um, and because of that, definitely their, um, their ability or their willingness to receive antenatal care is definitely affected and, you know, again, affecting the children or their child. Also, because of a lot of community factors um, or societal factors, they are experiencing a lot of missed opportunities. And again, from that sort of missed opportunities, such as in education and employment, again, it has repercussions on their later life, you know, being employed or working at during adulthood days, um, financial security as well. And so there are a lot of missed opportunities as well if the health system or the whole of system is not prepared to support these teenage mothers. Um, one of our studies as well found that because of some developmental and cognitive um, states, issues of, of teenage moms, they also have the tendency to um, practice suboptimal uh, feeding practice and particularly complementary feeding or introduction of solid foods. And as we all know, um, this really has a direct impact on the growth and development of their babies. And so they, once they got, get stunted, um, they have the increase, um, they have increased likelihood to have poor educational performance as well as poor, poor economic outcomes. Um, and because of the accumulated risks, both from the mom and during the, I guess, childhood days of, of an individual, of, of the child, they're actually at risk of abuse and neglect from their parents. They, some studies also found that they have the increased tendency to have violent and antisocial behavior and other externalizing um, behaviors. They also have the increased tendency to be depressed. So we found some um, symptoms of depression during their teenage years and adulthood years, um, adult years. So why I'm bringing this? Um, there are actually at least According to Philippine Statistics Authority, 538 babies are born to Filipino teenage mothers every single day. And we do have around roughly 132,000 teenage mothers. And they tend to get pregnant again. So they will have, again, another pregnancy or repeat pregnancy. And this is really telling us that, you know, if we want to have sustainable outcomes, particularly in the aging or adulthood and through the aging um, stage, 
um, the health system must be must anticipate the different health programs or strategies to mitigate all these risk factors that affects that could affect our this current cohort of individuals. Um, it's important for us to provide support and preventative interventions, um, and because otherwise, you know, our the future health condition of our country will be affected because this will be the next generation of older elderly people that we will we will look after 10 to 20 years from now i think Car caroline will share some of her research on mental health thank you joma um i am going to i acknowledge here that i'm drawing on the work of, of my own research but also all the uh, the research of our colleagues who might have started at uq but are now spread across australia and overseas so i'd like to uh, pay attention to some of their work and draw threads on it that relate to what we're talking about today so um, my own area is is mental health and substance use and so we're going to talk about how those things can both affect and be affected by different parts of our lifespan and contribute to issues that are important for healthy aging. So one of the things that we need to consider is the interaction between mental health and physical health. There's a mutual causation uh, and there's an impact on the access to both the condition, then the person's access to treatment and supports, their adherence to that treatment and then the treatment outcomes that are involved in that. And the reason I've chosen this image, which is an Aboriginal artwork from some of the rock shelters in the Northern Territory, is that it shows the handprints of multiple generations of the family and community who've lived there. And you can see that they're all overlaid over time. There isn't one specific area that's for children and one for adults and one for older adults. They're all in together and the artwork that comes together comprises all of those those handprints and that is how our health is constructed and that's very much the Aboriginal concept of health and well-being they don't separate physical health mental health connection to community and connection to country they recognize that all these things are part of our one condition so we're only just learning now that we should be looking to ancient knowledge to to take this wisdom forward so one of the things that we find is that there are impacts of physical health on mental health. So we found that preeclampsia in the mother is related to the risk of autism spectrum disorder in the, their offspring. And that's been established through a large body of work. Um, we can see the association between hypertensive disorders in utero um, and the effect of the offspring's mental health and the behavioural problems that manifest in later life in, in adolescence and further on. And we can see um, an association between things like physical infections of the mother during pregnancy and then post-traumatic stress disorder that emerges later on in her offspring. So the physical conditions of the mother have a strong impact on the mental health of, of their offspring. But we can also see other directions where we can see that the mother's mental health and in fact the father's mental health as well can have a strong relationship with physical problems like uh, and developmental issues like autism spectrum disorders in the offspring. Um, and again that's been established through reviewing a wide body of work. The other thing to go forward with, um, if we could click again please Joma, um, is that the relationships with the community are very important. So autism spectrum disorder has a devastating ability, uh, impact on an individual's ability to engage with their family, with education, which then impacts on their later opportunities in life, but also to interact with a community that will be very important in supporting them as their life continues. So there are environmental issues that impact on our health and they can be parental stress or anxiety that affect gestational development. Uh, they can be the parental anxiety early in life that uh, create anxiety in the young children in the family. Uh, there can be some learning and modelling of behaviour where parental stress is modelled to children as how you deal with difficulty and so the children go on to learn that behaviour and carry that forward into their later life. And then you have examples like trauma, um, which 
increases the likelihood of both physical and mental health problems and help seeking. So that trauma, whether it happens in early childhood or later in life, can continue to impact on the person's well-being as they progress in their health journey. So there are some of the challenges, but there are also some opportunities um, for bolstering health. So one of the things that we found in our big studies was that relationships are very, very important. So there can be problematic aspects of relationships where substance use and mental health can make a person more likely to be a victim of intimate partner violence, for example. Um, but when we were looking at protective factors in the family and the relationship with mental health, we found a really, really strong um, protective effect of warmth between the mother and the child. So that was external of any education or any parenting practices. It didn't require any input from anybody else. It was just the warmth of the relationship between a mother and her baby and that child as they developed into um, a young person and an adolescent. And that was very, very protective of both mental health, some physical health and substance use disorders in the offspring later on. So that's a really positive thing for us to take forward uh, because we can foster that warmth. And if we can keep that warmth going, it becomes protective. Now, the other thing for us to consider on top of that is that these relationships are not always one way. I'm sorry if we can stay with that, Gemma, thank you. Um, as parents and older adults become stressed, that can be because of their interactions with their younger children. Um, and the, uh, the way that we cope with our younger families and we worry about them as we get older. Um, and in a lovely study that one of our very, very senior professors did looking at a longitudinal um, study, he looked at it and said, oh yes, it's having children that causes the mothers to drink. And so the children are the creation of the problem. It's not the other way around. So it's very important for us to consider that these relationships work in both directions. Uh, and again, we come back to our hands to show us that these relationships overlay each other. There is no necessarily single order in which things that can happen. So it's important for us to keep looking at what the factors are around a person that are impacting them. And we found that over time, we realised that the, the more proximal effects, so things that have happened closer in time to the current situation, have the strongest effects, but there are major effects that happen early in life that can continue to have a really, really strong effect throughout the person's life. And an example of that is mothers smoking during pregnancy. In every study that we've done using our big longitudinal studies, Mothers smoking during pregnancy is a very strong and enduring risk for physical, mental and substance use um, problems later on in life. So we can't just look at one window. We can't just look at early life. We must continue to look at the factors impacting on a person over time. If we can move on. Um, thank you. The other area that we look at is substance use and alcohol. And it's important for us to consider both legal and illegal drugs because um, alcohol and tobacco use are very normalized in our societies. And so these things start to manifest early. The risks we can see quite early. And one of our recently graduated students um, showed through examining again, a big body of work, that the externalizing and internalizing symptoms that emerge in childhood and continue to show in adolescence are really strong predictors of problems with alcohol use, but also mental health problems um, as the person gets a little bit older. So it's important for us to look early. And in fact, it's important for us to start looking really, really, really early. Because one of the other things that we found in our big longitudinal studies was that socioeconomic disadvantage, which is something that we almost take for granted in epidemiological studies, has a really massive impact on the health and well-being of a person. And we found that the socioeconomic disadvantage as a child is born has a, an enduring impact on the way that their health progresses through teenagehood and into early adulthood. And this is because the factors around the parents' well-being, their education, their employment, the family's wealth and stability, those all have strong impacts on the way a young person is able to develop in a family and the patterns they learn in, in uh, learning to cope with challenges. 
Now that becomes more complicated as the young person progresses and they have their own education coming into play and their own employment opportunities coming into play. But again, this is often based on the experiences early in childhood from their immediate family. So it's very important for us to consider that side of the person as well as their physical health and their mental health as we traditionally measure it. The other thing that this impacts is the person's ability to seek and receive help for their health. Um, it might be an issue of health literacy, it might be where they live is too far away from services that can be reached easily, or the costs of achieving access to those services can be beyond their realm. So it's very important when we are health practitioners that we consider the social aspects of the person's health and their situation that might have brought them to the current situation, but also their ability to engage with the health system right now. Um, we often then think, um, about how things might change over time or not as the case may be. And we found that not all groups of people are the same. So when we started to look at how substance use disorders associate with different forms of mental health disorders, we did find that different patterns um, emerge for different groups of people at young adulthood. There are some who go through life and, and do quite well. They don't seem to accumulate mental health problems and they don't engage with substance use as well. There are some that have mental health problems only and don't engage with substances. And then there are groups of, of young people, luckily a sm much smaller group who engage with substance use, who have accumulated mental health problems. And there are distinct predictors for each of those different groups. So it's important for us to look at these things that happen to a person over their lifetime, um, because we find that those four very specific groups also have different prognoses as they move into adulthood. So those who have enduring problems with substance use and mental health do less well as they get older. They don't stay as engaged with their community so they don't engage with treatment, they don't engage with community supports, they disengage with their families. So they become a risk. So when that risk is identified earlier in life, in early adulthood perhaps, then more strategies can be put in place to care for them as they age. The other thing is that some of the behaviours that we expect will pass as people get out of the problematic sort of teenage years, um, don't always do so. So some of the uh, challenges around drinking um, endure quite a lot. And in Australia, in fact, they, although 18 to 28 year olds are probably the people who drink the most in a single session, so binge drinking, those who are at greatest risk of long term um, health problems in response to their drinking are in fact the middle and later years. So those who are 50 plus, uh, and that's often because they've been drinking since very early, they've continued, perhaps they smoked as a younger person, as in Joma's example earlier on, which adds a cumulative risk to them. But often they don't think of themselves as being people at risk as well. So they don't engage with opportunities to modify their behaviour. And some recent work has shown that the social drinking contexts are important influencing the drinking, but they also show up that there are a lot of social harms from that drinking as well that we often don't consider. And that's things like um, violence within the family, unemployment, um, family breakdown, loss of friendships. And so the effects radiate outwards from the individual as well as the community having an effect on them. And then thinking again about how things progress over time, older adults aren't immune from problems um, with substance use as well, because as we get older uh, and as our health starts to break down, we're often engaging with multiple different types of therapies um, to treat us. So you need to have a whole array of pills every day at different times um, to manage our health. And that can become a risk for us as these interactions between the medications accumulate um, or as perhaps our cognitive features decline somewhat and we don't remember as well how many of the medications we should have at any one time. Uh, and we're very much involved at the moment in looking at the risk of opioid overdose and the primary candidates for that aren't people who use illicit opioids 
the people who are most at risk are those who use prescription opioids and very often older people um, who are using more than is good for them because they don't remember or if they're not taking uh, very strong notice of what other medications they're taking that also puts their health at risk so we have to consider uh, things that will have accumulated over their lifetime the multiple different types of physical health problems that they might be experiencing their cognitive ability to manage all of those medications, and then strategies for reducing harm, like having naloxone handy, um, are very important to manage those risks in older populations as well. So now I'm going to hand back to Joma, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges and implications of this research. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, so, you know, I guess the overall implication of what we discussed, Caroline and I discussed a while ago, is really, you know, that it's really, really good to start early, um, knowing that all these factors and outcomes um, and the accumulation of risks and occurrence of risks at critical stages, it, it's really, really important for us to think about how can we mitigate those risks that, that the person was, was exposed to so that they will have better outcomes at a later stage. But also think about how can we leverage on those experiences that they had to ensure optimal health. And in fact, you know, in WHO um, um, defined healthy aging as not being free of any disease or infirmity. So what I wanna say here is all these risk factors sometimes are inevitable and it's whether you know, it's sort of good or bad. But then I guess as health professionals, as researchers, as program managers, development workers, we need to think about how can we leverage on those? How can we mitigate those risks to, to be able to help our aging population to, to develop and maintain functional ability and that, that will enable them to achieve well-being at a later stage. Um, and considering life course, life course approach will definitely help us to think about the interventions at each of those life stages. Um, and you know, when, when, when we're talking about sustainable development goals, definitely it highlights the, the importance of the, the, the delivery of appropriate health services as well as social services. And it also recognizes the interaction of people, society, and environment. Um, but then again, it's not easy. Um, to, to really implement a life course approach in, in research and practice. Um, as, you, as we all know, the different health programs and even in research, um, both in develop and developing contexts are siloed. So they're focused on you know, some stages and not really considering the entire um, um, life course of a person. Um, that's why it's really, really important for us to consider those complexities um, and the, how each risk factors at different age groups, the interactions of parents and, and, and kids um, and their children should be considered. Um, and it also indicates that we need to have good coordination um, because of different social environmental factors. Um, we need to think about how, it, how we can coordinate programs with, with the health sector and other sectors, as well as programs within the health sector. Um, Looking at service integration, we can have the vertical approach, which I, I think we're already doing. Um, we need to think about how family and, and individual and family and community services could talk to each other, could be streamlined to be able to contribute to those outcomes that we want at a later stage. Um, we also need to think about how those services connect with the primary care facilities where initial treatment could be provided including outpatient services and also the referral hospitals or the tertiary hospitals where most of the rehabilitation and management programs are being implemented. Um, this is also what I, what I want to highlight is the importance of the horizontal approach or horizontal integration where we need to consider different social determinants of health and it requires the involvement of other sectors. I think um, Dr. Vin Luan mentioned about, you know, they're sort of thinking about developing um, a strategy for healthy cities or age-friendly cities. Um, you know, envi um, environment is really, really important, especially in urban areas. So I think it's really important for them to consider how, you know, I guess different sectors of, or, or aspects of, of 
an urban place, for example, should should really accommodate the different needs of not just of our aging population, but also of different um, individuals at different stages, because it will affect, again, their future outcomes. And once we have this sort of um, horizontal approach, then we can think about how can we um, develop supportive environments. Um, and it's again, it's not necessarily about the health programs, which everyone is knowledgeable about and, and um, competent in implementing, but also how, again, how can we support um, um, particular cohorts who are experiencing um, difficulties? Um, because again, they will affect our future generation. So, um, and also we can think about how can we, um, how can we make those supportive interventions available or approaches available at different locations or spaces? You know, for example, here, um, developed by WHO in Europe, they were able to develop a strategy to really promote physical activity, not just at home, but also at work, school, and in, in the community. And I think here in Australia, particularly in Brisbane, the government is really pushing for the use of public transport. So particularly for students where they're making the public transport cheaper for students. I think it's 80% lower than what the adults or the working class is paying. Um, so again, but then again, another complication is COVID. So um, that's another thing to consider, but I won't talk about it now. Um, and then lastly, um, another challenge is, you know, the, the shifts in political priorities, the short term, um, also the short term policies. And therefore, we need to have a shift in political and programmatic thinking. We need to think about long term vision. We need to think about, you know, how, what investment can we put in to ensure sustainable outcomes um, at a later stage? We need to also tell our policymakers, politicians about, you know, the expectations that, that the results may not occur immediately, but it, it will occur later on, but it's sort of a sustainable change, sustainable improvement that we will see later on. And one of the, um, I guess, practical approach that we can do is early detection. Um, because early detection and screening will definitely help us to know when can we implement early interventions, such as information dissemination, um, individual education and counseling, as well as treatment and management. Another is, uh, as I said a while ago, monitoring the people with certain characteristics at individual and population levels. Um, for one of the things that I'm thinking that we, Caroline and I were actually thinking last time was, you know, that the current um, students or college, adolescents and young adults, and even the working class who are experiencing a lot of, I guess, um, financial difficulties, a lot of health difficulties. So if we will not really think about, you know, how can we support them, then definitely 10 to 20 years from now, we will have some difficulty supporting them at the, when they're, um, you know, at their senior citizen stage. So we need to anticipate, prepare for the services that is required. Um, And then another approach is, again, doing a longitudinal study. Um, I know that longitudinal studies are costly. It requires time. Some people don't want to participate in follow-up interviews. But then again, it has a lot of advantages if it is done properly. We can have a more comprehensive information about an individual at each stages. We can also explore causation. And I think this, this is really, really important because most of the studies that we have are cross-sectional studies and it doesn't necessarily give us good or robust information or conclusion about risk factors and outcomes. And so if we have longitudinal studies and we can establish, I guess, temporality or, you know, it, that, that, that risk factors really happen before the outcome um, and that can happen through longitudinal studies, then definitely we will be able to make right decisions about, um, about our society. And also looking at interventions, not just individual interventions, but I guess macro level interventions, political um, strategies, health agendas. I think um, doing longitudinal studies can also help us track improvements of, of cohorts affected by those um, big, big policies, big interventions. Um, one of the studies that I guess I want to share is the Cebu longitudinal study. Um, it's a three-generation cohort, meaning they were able to survey the mother, 
during 1980s, their children, and then the grandchildren. But I think the study is not being conducted now. I think the last time that they were able to collect data was 2015. But then again, what I want to say is that um, this is a good example of a longitudinal study that we can replicate to enable us to uh, develop more con the generalizable conclusion and localized interventions as well, particularly in Metro Manila. And I recognize that we have um, national representative longitudinal studies, but I think it's also important for us to have more localized in, um, longitudinal studies, especially Manila is a, it's a massive city. Um, another one is, you know, use of big data. I think um, this is an alternative um, approach for longitudinal studies. We can use health records. We can use um, records from other sectors. You know, we can leak information, but then it requires good infrastructure to be able for us to access those information and link those data across sectors. Um, and also think about another innovative, um, innovative approaches to obtain information. So one of the things that we're currently designing is use of social media data to detect mental health problems among teenagers. And we're, collab we're doing this in collaboration with Ateneo de Manila um, um, and also um, University of Manchester Health Policy Institutes in Vietnam. And so we're trying to develop an algorithm that will enable us to collect mental health data during the pandemic. And we all know it's hard to collect data nowadays. It's hard to do surveys because of the social distancing um, um, restrictions. So I would let Caroline share. Um, Thanks again, Joma. Um, I'm just going to talk very briefly about the Marty University have drawn this space on the initial number of, of pregnant women who came to the hospital and were enrolled in the study. Um, we started monitoring 7,223 live singleton babies, but very importantly, their mothers as well. So we have both generations and we're able to then look at the follow up over some critical time points in birth. So pre birth, immediately we have birth um, data, then we have some at three to five days after six months five years, 14, 21 and 30 years. So if we think back to transitional periods that we talked about earlier on, we've been able to pick up some of those very important transition points in their life uh, for the offspring. But we're also able to see what's happening for their mothers whose age range is shifted by between 16 and 30 years. So we can see not only what's happening um, between the two different age groups, but we can look at the generational shift. So now that the offspring are 30, we can see what's different for young people at 30 years. And of course, because I'm much older than that, then 30 year olds are very young, um, but also how different that is to when their mothers were 30 years old. And now that the third generation has been born, we will have a future opportunity to see how that generational shift has been impacting the, the health and well-being of the children of the children as we move forward. So we have uh, the opportunity to look at not only the health and the well-being, um, and we have a lot of social and attitudinal data for these people as well, um, and their relationships and their involvement in their communities. But we can look at how attitudes and society impact on their health as well. So the environment in the 1980s is very different to what's happening in 2020. The attitudes to parenthood, to motherhood, to young people, these things change seismically over time. So we need to be able to take that into account as well. Um, the lovely thing about that is that it does give us a range of different issues that we can look at that we know now that are very important over time. But we also, um, because of the richness of the data and the fact that there are longitudinal studies in other areas, we can produce collaborative opportunities. So we've given you an example of the MUSP, which is an Australian study, and there are other specialised ones in Australia that focus on young people or on women. 
Um, there are studies in America, the US Minnesota Twins study that follows twins, which give us further opportunities. The Christchurch study in New Zealand, which has been following people up far more regularly, so they have much smaller time intervals. Um, there's one in the UK which has started much later, so it gives us a different generational check. And then there are some in different countries like Finland, which have a very different health system. So we're able to compare the context and the culture in which health and well-being are happening, as well as what's happening across the lifespan. We have different contexts, we have different technical aspects, and so that becomes a great opportunity for us to collaborate with people within our countries and between our countries, and fostering that sharing of knowledge, both at the intrinsic research level uh, the technical level on how we collect the information, how we link out to big data sets that Joma spoke about, uh, and then how we implement that knowledge into novel health and social programs, and then how we go on to evaluate those programs and see the impact that they have on the people who've been engaged with them. So all of these things give us a huge opportunity to share across our knowledge communities, uh, and particularly with the emerging knowledge communities of all the students and the emerging practitioners who have joined us today. So we invite you to join us in collaboration um, to design points of intervention together to address health in that very important 360 degree context that we've been talking about. And so we can work together as we move forward to improve health across the lifespan and create super seniors, not just in the Philippines, but perhaps in the Philippines as a model for what we can do in the rest of the world as well. So with that, I would like to say salamat po. Thank you very much for having us both. Uh, and we have very much enjoyed being part of your collaboration today. Uh, and we look forward to hosting your questions now. Thank you very much. Can I call to the stage once again, Dr. Martinez and Dr. De Leon to start the open forum, but um, perhaps just uh, in the interest of time, uh, perhaps you could accommodate one question, but for the other inquiries, we will be sending our speakers their questions. And if you find time, please do get back to our um, uh, delegates with your answers to their question. Dr. Martinez, Dr. De Leon, you may have the floor. Okay. Good morning again, and thank you for the wonderful presentation. So the question is from um, Shili de la Vega. I uh, know, um, pardon. It is, this is from Dr. Cotianco de la Paz from UP. Her question is, do you also have done any epigenetic studies to illustrate environmental influence on genomic implementing? Again, from those, do you also done or have done any epigenetic studies to illustrate environmental influence on genomic imprinting? Dr. Salomon, Dr. Thank you. That's a very good question. And that is a very nexus of, of physical and mental health, the impact on the, the genetic collateral, if you like, that you're born with. So there are some very good studies um, that are a good example of to separate their experiences, their experiences over life and see how those impact on the genetic imprint as you say that they have brought into life um, so if you look at the minnesota twin study and i can post a link to that you will find that there are some very strong gene versus environment things and that's why it shows one of the things we're to look at now the gene-wide association studies that are uh, can identify some of the candidate genes particularly around mental health that are important in later style um, with my background in molecular biology, however, I think they're a little bit limited because they can't show us what happens to those genes as the person progresses over their lifespan. We can't tell because not every gene that we're born with is actually expressed in our body. That expression of the 
seen is controlled by our environment. So we're still learning a great deal about how those things are progressing. One of the areas that's showing up at the moment is cortisol, which is a um, obviously, as you know, is, is released in response to stress. So the responsiveness of the cortisol genes um, vary across different people, um, both intrinsically as they're born, but in their response to environmental stressors. So that's an area that we're looking in, which provides some targets for mental health interventions, especially. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we would like to call now to the stage once again, Dr. Generoso Pamitan, the director of the University Research Center for uh, the Far Eastern University, to award our speakers with a, uh, with an electronic certificate. Dr. Pamitan. Hello. Okay. Once again, good morning, and uh, on behalf of MMHRDC, I'd like to express our sincere gratitude to our speakers all the way from Australia, Dr. Caroline Salom and uh, Dr. Jomer Maravilla. Uh, please allow me to read the certificate. Certificate of uh, Metro Manila Health Research and Development Consortium in cooperation with Far Eastern University and Our Lady of Fatima University present this Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Caroline Salom and Dr. Jomer Maravilla for exhibiting exemplary knowledge and competence as speakers in the webinar, The Road to Super Seniors, uh, The Science of Aging, given this September, 12th day of September, 2020. So once again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Caroline and Dr. Jomer for sharing with us multifaceted studies and of course, for your insightful discussion on life course approach to aging. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much to our speakers. Again, for those of you who post questions or inquiries, whether in Facebook or here in the chat box, we will forward our, all your questions and inquiries to, to our speakers. And hopefully they will get back to you the soonest possible time or as soon as they are available. Moving on with the program, allow me to introduce our last speaker for this morning, but definitely not the least. Our speaker for this morning is a proud alumna of the Far Eastern University, uh, Nicanor Reyes Medical Foundation School of Medicine, where she graduated cum laude. She then pursued her residency training in dermatology at the Jose R. Reyes Memorial Medical Center and later on became a top notcher of the Dermatology Specialty Board. She likewise completed her Dermatopathology course program at the Thomas Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, USA, under the tutelage of Dr. Bernard Ackerman. In addition, she also did fellowship course in dermatologic laser surgery at the Romati Bodhi Hospital, Mahidon University in Bangkok, Thailand. Moreover, she underwent preceptorial training under Dr. Howard Maybach at the Contact Dermatitis Clinic at the University of California, again in the U.S. of A. From 2011 to 2012, our esteemed speaker served as president of the Philippine Dermatological Society and of the Paranaque Medical Society. Today, she is the chair of the Department of Dermatology of the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine. Likewise, she is the head of the section of dermatology of both the San Juan de Jos Educational Foundation Incorporated and the Hospital Nam Paranaque. In addition, she heads the Leprosy Subspecialty Core Group and is an honorary advisor of the Medical Journal of the Philippine Dermatological Society. Our speaker has many publications in various local and international medical journals and has co-authored a few chapters on dermatology and standard references and books. Our speaker is a fellow and belongs to the Council of Advisors of the Philippine Dermatological Society. Likewise, she's a non-resident fellow of the American Academy of Dermatology, and she's an active member of the International Society of Dermatology, the Asian Dermatological Association, the Philippine, the Philippine Environmental and Occupational Dermatology, and the Asian Consensus Board on Orticaria. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give a big round of, a, a round of virtual applause for Dr. Maria Teresita G. Gabriel. Thank you very much for that uh, most generous introduction. 
I didn't put the defying aging as my title because I thought uh, my title was the road to super seniors, the science of aging. It's earlier than you think, but it's never too late. However, if you'd give me a chance to make my own title, I would make it hide your age no more. So thank you very much to MMHRDC for the invitation. And I'm glad to be able to share with you uh, my lecture on this topic. So when you look at aging, it's actually an inevitable fact of life. But I just wonder why everyone is afraid of aging. You know, it's just like wine, fine wine. It becomes better with a passage of time. Now, well, you can have a different perspective when you look at the meaning of super seniors. And uh, among these people who don't hide their age, it's because it comes with knowledge, wisdom, and decades of experience, just like our past presidents. When you look at aging, it refers to a decline of biological functions and the organism's ability to adapt to metabolic stress with time. And there are different types of aging. There are theories of aging. One is genetic or intrinsic, which is a preordained process. You cannot stop this from coming. The telomere lengths, the terminal portions of the chromosome would shorten at every cell cycle. And once it reaches a critical length, then it will arrest or apoptosis would occur. The other theory is extrinsic or environmental, which is more or less the most that can give you damage to your skin because it generates free radicals or reactive oxygen species and their activity of antioxidant enzymes would decline with age. These are brought about by UV radiation, overeating. Did you know that when you eat high carbohydrate diet, you get a lot of glycated proteins, which are deposited in your skin and blood vessels and gives you premature aging and all the bad effects of overeating. Smoking generates reactive oxygen species, which also causes premature aging. Stress, even caloric restriction, and other forms of radiation, including infrared and ionizing radiation. So among the age-associated skin changes that we would like to address are roughness, dryness, and thinning of the skin, sagging in elastic wrinkled skin, pigmentary changes, telangiectasia, loss of fat leading to changes in facial contour, and a lot of outgrowths from seborrheic keratosis, skin tags, milia, and even the benign and malignant lesions. Malignant lesions just like squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, and your menaloma, which are age-associated changes we would like to prevent. I would like to make this as simple as I could, pathogenesis of aging. UV light will release your reactive oxygen species. And what does it do? It has a direct damage on your DNA. It decreases your protein tyrosine phosphatases and causing an increase in your growth factor and cytokine receptors, an increase in the sejun and in this AP1 transcription factor that causes a decrease in your pro-collagen promoter and an increase in your matrix metalloproteinases. When you hear matrix metalloproteinases, it is responsible for destruction of your collagen. And with all this, you get destruction of collagen, collagen breakdown, and in a metalloproteinase activity is actually decrease, but there are certain MMPs that are prompting and causes collagen destruction. Now, another one is when you look at the RA, retinoic acid receptors, which has the same effect, which goes through the same pathway. On the extreme left, you will see that these are all effects on your keratinocytes and fibroblasts. Uh, the transforming growth factor receptors is decreased and there is a direct mutagenic effect on your DNA. The NF-kappa-B will increase causing increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines and 
the destruction of your extracellular matrix proteins. So there is what you call the Blugau classification, wrinkle severity scale. So for those who are only 20 to 35 years old, you are mild, no wrinkles, but you can have early photoaging, mild pigment changes, no keratosis, minimal wrinkles, minimal or no makeup. Now, when you get a little higher, like 35 to 40, then you get your wrinkles in motion and your skin gets more signs of photoaging, like visible keratosis, palpable ones, and parallel smile lines begins to appear. Then you would need some foundation. Now, for those who are 50 to 65 years old, then you would have wrinkles at rest. And that's what you call advanced photoaging, which would make you need to use heavier foundation. While for those who are really with only wrinkles, they are at the four, uh, grade four wrinkle severity scale of blue cow. Then they even have sometimes yellow gray skin color, skin malignancies, wrinkles throughout, and makeup cannot help anymore because it cakes and it cracks. So there are ways to prevent, even at an early age, when you're only a type one blue scale or no wrinkles, and you want to delay aging, then you can have a daily skin protection with a sunscreen. In the past, they would say SPF 15, but if you want a stronger one, then you can do SPF 30 or 50. Moisturizers and over-the-counter lotions would contain alpha-hydroxy acids or antioxidants. If you're belonging to type 2, then you would have to add your retinol, you will have to add prescription medicines like tretinoin and hydroquinone if you really have this pigmentation. But of course, uh, it should be given by the experts because when you use a higher percentage of hydroquinone, instead of pigmentation, can you still hear me? Hello? Yes. Hello? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes, we can so, hear you. I'm sorry because it says lost connection. Then you would have to be very careful with your hydroquinone because if you use a very high percentage, then you would have ochronosis, which means that your pigmentation is darker and that the pigment is down in the dermis. Now, wrinkles at rest, then you need pills, you need injections, you need resurfacing, and even fillers. And if you only have wrinkles like type 4, I think we need to call a friend. We need to call our surgeon friends. Aside from all the modalities that I have mentioned, we need to have a partnership with our surgeon friends. So anti-aging is really a multi-pronged approach. There is what you call in this journal of JAAD, primary intervention. Use sunscreen, retinoids, antioxidants, sorry for the spelling. And there are a lot of growth factors available in the market. Secondary intervention, chemical peels, microdermabrasion, resurfacing techniques, radiofrequency, PRP and lasers, and tertiary intervention would include your procedures like botulinum toxins, fillers, and lately, we've had threads. Okay, when we say primary intervention, it refers to the reduction of risk factors even before the condition has occurred. So limit sun exposure, when the sun rays are strongest at 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So use broad spectrum sunscreen up to be able to read. It should block both UVA and UVV. You were meant to believe that you have this fit in your car, then you're protected, sorry, but it can only protect you against UVB. So you will still have the bad effects of the sun. SPF can be a minimum of 15 for the younger age group. But for the more matured, I don't want to call it uh, elderly, for the more matured age group, then you would need something higher like SPF 30. If you already have photo damaged skin, I would suggest an SPF 50. And you have to see if your sunscreen, you don't call it sunblock anymore, you call it sunscreen because nobody can block the rays of the sun. Then it should be water resistant, which means that it can stay 
for a longer period of time, even if you sweat or if you immerse in water. And even if it's cloudy, you would have to put sunscreen. And ideally, you can apply sunscreen 20 minutes before you go outdoors and reapply every two hours. Of course, uh, this is not so practical. Then you may probably just apply one in the morning and one at lunchtime for as long as you're using a water-resistant sunscreen. What are the risk factors for photoaging? You have different skin phototypes. If you're on the, you know, on the uh, Caucasians, then I will show you later on the phototypes. Now, the sun height, the nearer you are, the more damage it has. The nearer you are at the latitude proximity to the equator and the more cloud cover, the cloud does not protect you. It's, it, it is a misconception that when it's cloudy, you're protected. Ozone layer thickness and ground reflection. So even if in your covered area, if there's a reflection from the ground, then you get the bad effects of your sun. And even when you're underwater, you also get the bad effects of the sun. It's even worse when you're underwater. So these are the different skin phototypes. One are for the lighter, always burns, never tans. And if you will see through this, we more or less, Asians belong to skin phototype four. We are blessed because we have a lot of melanocyte, which protects us from the bad effects of the sun. And rarely would we get, unless it's related to our uh, occupation, uh, rarely would we get the uh, malignancies. Okay. So there are four simple ways that you can be protected. Ski, sleep, slop, slap, and rock. So sleep on a shirt, clothes that cover the most area, dark color, tightly woven fabrics, lightweight and comfortable fabrics, dry clothes, clothes that protect from exposure, even in weight, because you know there are a lot that has already has this uh, SPF in their clothes. Slap on a sunscreen that this is the first that you should be using on a regular basis. And you can also protect your lips with balms. And there are some makeup that has UV protection. Slap on hot, use tightly woven wide brimmed hats that cover often exposed to the sun, air that are really exposed to the sun. This is just an additional help. Then wrap on sunglasses large frame wrapped around sunglasses and there are labels that you can try to read through children's sunglasses with the same protective characteristics are those as those designed for adults they also have that so let's go to the secondary intervention early detection of disease while still asymptomatic to allow positive interference or prevent, postpone, or admit the clinical condition. So the mainstay are retinoids, but there are different types of retinoids because you know one of the adverse effects of retinoids is really reddening and it's photosensitive. So the newer retinoids are adapalene. Tazarotin is actually not uh, available in the Philippines, but it's very strong. So adapalene is available, but I think the other retinoids are still available in the market. So it improves wrinkling, roughness, hyperpigmentation, and sallowness. So there are antioxidants that's available in the market. Topical vitamin C, then you have COQ10, ubiquinone, alpha lipoic acid, even estrogens and growth factors. So you can ask your dermatologist, so many products in the market, claiming to be effective just because it contains vitamin C it to be effective. You should take green sunburn cell formation after UV exposure. And it can also upregulate your collagen and the TIMP synthesis in human skin. And in the six-month double-blind placebo-controlled randomized trial on the use of topical vitamin C, there is a significant decrease of wrinkles using profilometry, which is a very objective way of seeing the results. So COQ10, 
is an antioxidant in the skin tend fold higher levels in the epidermis and dermis. And studies would show that there is significant reduction as you use it longer. So don't make promises like a month or two. This is a six month pilot study. You have to be practical when you give deliverables. Alpha lipoic acid reduces the production of transcription factors. I've shown in the pathogenesis that NF kappa B uh, has an effect on aging and it directly affects the gene expression of certain inflammatory cytokines, improvement in clinical and objective measurements of photoaging. So estrogen, topical estrogen treatment has been shown to increase collagen, firmness, elasticity. And a majority of patients would show clinical improvement in at least one facial area and a significant change in objective measurements again. So I would say that there is not one modality that would address aging. So it has to be multi-pronged. So tertiary intervention, chemical peels, even during Cleopatra's time when she was bathing herself in milk, this milk contained tartaric acid. And the French women were bathing in old wine, which contained lactic acid. So chemical pills has been there since time, wrinkles, improvement of pores, uh, comedones, acne, keratosis, melasma, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, freckles, melanosis. It can also be used for scars. And the chemical peels are classified depending on the depth of the tissue injury. So it's classified as superficial, medium, and deep, depending on the percentages of your glycolic, on your salicylic, and in your trichloracetic acid. So there are certain advantages. It's a simple office procedure with a short curve but you care and it should be individualized and as I've said it can be combined with other modalities however it comes with disadvantages complications may occur it's a slow process results are not permanent and priming and adjunctive therapy is necessary and there have been reports before that deep pills may have systemic toxicity and there have been reported death because they have been doing body pills. So they have to be very careful with that. If you don't know how to do chemical pills, you might end up with a patient like this. Please be very careful. So lasers is a form of tertiary intervention. So you have to know the indications of certain lasers because not all lasers are created equal. You have CO2, Erbium YAG as ablative, and for non ablative lasers, you have fractional and radio frequency technology. Botulinum toxin, uh, it is used in minute doses to treat painful spasms in the past, but it is a cosmetic treatment, and approved indications are wrinkles in the forehead and crow's feet. And you have to know your anatomy well because you wouldn't want to end with. Uh, one eye uh, closed, the other eyes open, a symmetry of uh, areas where it was injected. So let me now go through my last slides. Role of functional foods in cutaneous anti-aging because there's so many people who are now into functional foods. Carotenoids, beta-carotene would give you an FDA maximum dose of 300 milligrams per day. In this study, 30 photo age female subjects, 90 days of 30 milligrams of carotene supplementation has improved facial wrinkles, elasticity, procollagen, and decreased UV-induced dimer staining, and all those signs of aging that is seen under the microscope. And it seems to render the skin more susceptible if it's higher already. So be very careful. Aside from having these yellowish tints on your skin, if you over uh, eat your carotene, then you have this carotinemia on your skin. So there is a certain 
maximum that you would be using for your carotene. Okay? Just 30, not 90. Oh, lobster. So that's astaxanthin. It's a carotenoid distributed in marine organisms responsible for the red color of lobsters and shrimps. And it has shown that when you combine it with collagen, three grams per day, it improves facial elasticity and barrier integrity. It again upregulates your pro-collagen and your decreases your MMP1 and 12 expression in human subjects compared to placebo. So you have the EGCG. It's very difficult. It's epigallocatechin gallate. So it has been shown to increase your minimum erythema dose, which means you are less prone to photo damage, skin barrier function, and reduce UVB induced skin damage in rats. So here are your pecan peanuts and your coffee. Their study showed that the human dermis forms a stronger barrier to absorption from the vasculature. So it was only proven effective in rats, but not in human beings. So you have soybean, anti-aging, referred to as your phytoestrogen or isoflavones. In human subjects, facial wrinkles are decreased after 12 weeks of your isoflavones. So there are peanuts, so there are tea, green. You would need to have more robust clinical studies. Aloe vera supplementation. Uh, Lodos in 30 photo ages, female volunteers for 90 days, resulting in improvement of wrinkles as well. So it is attributed to the polysaccharide in your aloe vera that increases collagen biosynthesis. So this is prepared in Panax, air drying Panax ginseng. So I was uh, giving a uh, trying to tease my friends that once they go to any area with ginseng, then they can give me ginseng instead as my gift. So the roots of your ginseng has antioxidant, immunostimulatory, and anti-aging activity. And in this study, among 82 volunteers, the, to assess the red ginseng's effect, which was compared to placebo. Then they took three grams of the red ginseng for 24 weeks, and there was a decrease in wrinkles and the biochemical and histologic evidence of increase in your collagen. And this is due to the call one a 2 promoter and SMAD signaling according to this study. Vitamin C and E. So vitamin C is a major antioxidant inhibitor of lipid peroxidation, and it also regenerates your vitamin E. Doses of from 500 milligrams to six grams showed no no benefit regarding skin aging. And vitamin E has a systemic photoprotective effect up to 800 milligrams per day, but you have to consult your cardiologist when you take these high doses of your vitamin E. So oral supplementation of C and E has proven insufficient in preventing skin aging due to poor solubility, inefficient skin permeability or instability during storage. So collagen peptide, there's a lot of collagen peptides out in the market now, but you would have to know which have studies. Oral supplementation of this collagen hydrosylate increases skin elasticity in middle-aged women after four weeks of supplementation and skin moisturizing effect as well. Prior studies have demonstrated that the hydrolysate is absorbed in the digestive tract and appears in human blood, part in a small peptide and is deposited in the skin for up to 96 hours. One controlled study found out that type 1 and type 4 collagen increases your MMP2, uh, while, uh, sorry, increases your collagen while decreases your MMP2. And this is responsible for its anti-aging effects. So participants, they took this drink at bedtime, which contained either your placebo or your fish collagen hydroxylate for 12 weeks in another study. And they showed that there was a significantly higher improvement in the treatment group versus the placebo group. But no, it's only 8.83%. So all of these are adjuncts. So don't be lured into thinking that functional supplements alone is enough to delay or defy aging.
So increase in glycosome in the plants was dose dependent with 3% more collagen in the presence of this collagen hydrosylate preparation and the maximal increase of 9% in the presence of 0.1. No change for the placebo. And so the conclusion was, it has provided clinical evidence to improve aging due to an increase in collagen and glycosaminoglycan synthesis with oral supplementation of your collagen hydrosylate. And here is the picture of my mom and my sisters. Uh, I am the eldest. And I hope that I have defied aging as well because it is very difficult to lecture when you cannot walk the talk. Thank you very much for your invite and for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gabrielle. Definitely, ma'am, you epitomize uh, graceful aging. <laughs> Thank you. So can we now call to the stage once again our moderators for the Q&A? Can we call to the stage Doctors Martinez and Dr. De Leon. Thank you, Dr. Javier. Thank you, Dr. Gabriel, for the presentation. Yeah. Thank um, you. I have one question for okay. the interest of time. Um, okay. From Rosario Valenzuela, are you familiar with the ASEA redox anti aging through the use of redox signaling molecules? I'm not familiar with that because I would have to review. I mean, I know there's a lot of talk about redox. However, until I see, I mean, there should be enough evidence, you know, uh, we, since you are into research, uh, it, everything should be evidence-based because the lowest form of evidence is, uh, we all know that uh, when people tell stories about how good they feel, about uh, how it helped them, but there are certain ways of seeing evidence like subjective and objective. The more objective your evidence is, the fairer it would be for me to say that it works or it doesn't work. But I am not in a position since I, ha I have not seen all the studies related to this redox. Thank you, Dr. Gabriel. Thank you. Okay, so I think, uh, again, in the interest of time, we will cut short the question and answer. However, we do remind our delegates that uh, kindly pose your question in the question and, answer, uh, question and answer box. We will forward your inquiries to our uh, panel of speakers and their, our speakers will hopefully get back to your inquiries the soonest possible time. Similarly, we'd also like to remind everyone that the, at the end of this session, you will have the post test. Uh, you need to answer the post test. The link will be available after the webinar session. You will be given two days to accomplish the post-test and if you successfully answer at least 60% of the post-test, you will be sent, uh, your certificate of active participation will be sent to you via email. So with that, I'd like to call now to the stage once again, the director of the University Research Center of the Far Eastern University, Dr. Generoso Pamitan, to award the electronic certificate to our esteemed speaker. Sir? Hello, good morning once again. And thank you very much, Dr. Gabriel, for the very informative presentation on defying aging. Listening to you, I couldn't help but to take a selfie and look at my face. <laughs> anyway, um, please allow me to present the certificate of appreciation, Metro Manila Health and Research Development Consortium in cooperation with Far Eastern University and Our Lady of Fatima University, presents the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Maria Teresita Gabriel for ex exhibiting exemplary knowledge and competence as speaker in the webinar, The Road to Super Seniors, The Science of Aging, given this 12th day of September, 2020. Thank you very much, Elef, Dr. Gabriel. Pipila na po yata sa mga derma at sa mga beauty shops. <laughs> Thank you very much. I am now very grateful to the abundant melanocytes that I have after listening <laughs> to the lecture of Dr. Gabriel. So we are very thankful for the kayumangging kaligata ng mga Pilipino. No? That actually confers added protection from a variety of dermatologic disorders. So with that, thank you very much. Can we now proceed? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Can we now Bye. proceed to the next part of the program for this morning? Next slide, please. 
And to deliver the closing remarks, we'd like to um, call to the stage the chair of the MMHRDC Research Utilization Committee and a scientist in residence from the De La Salle University of Manila. Let's give a big round of applause for Dr. Maria Luisa D. Enriquez. Hello, ma'am. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Good morning. And uh, thank you for uh, all our eloquent speakers for sharing uh, with us their research findings and research expertise that have enlightened us on various aspects of our road to aging. So our sincerest thanks to Dr. Minerva Binluan, to Dr. Caroline Salom, to Dr. Jomar Maravilla, to Dr. Maria Teresita Gabriel, and of course, to the heads of the MMHRDC core agencies, PCHRD, DOH, NCR, DOH, uh, DOST, NCR, the UP, NIH, and of course, to the Attorney Lily, Frida, Milia for uh, talking earlier, to the presidents of the institutions hosting this series, Dr. Michael Alba of FEU, and Dr. Caroline Marian Enriquez of Our Lady of Fatima University. To the organizing committee members, I will not mention your names anymore, but you know who you are. These are the hardworking MMHRDC members who spend their time for many Saturdays to make sure that this activity will be delivered to you as orderly as possible, barring the technical challenges. And most of all, to the MC, Dr. RJ Javier, and the moderators, Dr. Josephine De Leon and Dr. Kirby Martinez and Dr. Vino Solar. Our special thanks to the team of Dr. Dino and of the of OLFU and to all the participants. Please continue to follow us to two more Saturdays and other activities of MMHRDC such as a photo contest, research contest. Good day, everyone, and stay safe for the weekend and for the days coming ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much again, the chair of the MMHRDC uh, Research Utilization Committee, Dr. Uh, De Leon. Oh. And we are now on our screens, uh, the post-test and evaluation. Uh, kindly make sure you access the evaluation in the post-test. Again, this will be available for the next uh, uh, 48 hours. You have 48 hours to complete complete the evaluation form. We highly encourage that you keep the evaluation forms uh, to those who attended the conference this morning. And again, the electronic certificates of active, active participation will be sent to you via electronic mail. So kindly make sure you give us the, provide us with the correct address for your electronic certificates. And before we formally end, we will be Again, these are the links for the, uh, the um, post-test. And for the next webinar, which will be on September 19, 2020, we also have a line, um, in line a uh, good number of uh, esteemed speakers for next session. And we will be having a closing video. So again, uh, we'd like to thank everyone to all our delegates. A very successful morning. We have almost 400 participants to this morning's webinar. Uh, from the uh, once again, allow me to thank everyone. This is from this is Dr. R. J. Javier from the Department of Preventive and Community Medicine of the College of Medicine of QERM MMCI, saying good afternoon to everyone. And enjoy the rest of the day. Stay safe and let us watch the closing video of the MMHRDC. Magandang araw po sa inyo lahat.